This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Norman Finkelstein, scholar, activist, author. He has just published two books, one, Knowing Too Much, Why the American Jewish Romance with Israel is Coming to an End. His other is called What Gandhi Says About Nonviolence, Resistance and Courage. What does Gandhi say, Norm Finkelstein? Well, I think the, <clears throat> the first point is very few people read Gandhi. They just assume Gandhi, simple person, simple dresser, skinny, nonviolence. It's obvious what it means. But in fact, it's not obvious at all what nonviolence means for Gandhi. His collected works come, you'll be surprised, I think, to learn, they come to 98 volumes. And it's about 500 pages per volume. When I first started checking out the works at NYU Library, New York University Library, and NYU is a prominent research library, I think you'll be surprised also to learn, even though they acquired the collection in 1984, apart from one volume, I was the first person who ever checked out any volume of Gandhi's 98-volume collected works. I went through about half, 47 volumes, about 25,000 pages. I was curious to know what did Gandhi mean by nonviolence, because, I'm, you know, on reflection, it's not so obvious. And the first thing to say about it is Gandhi was not the kind of nonviolent pacifist that, for example, is depicted in Sir Richard Attenborough's uh, film on Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi valued nonviolence, no question about it. But he attached equal value and in some places you could say more value, to courage. Not just nonviolence, but courage. And he found nothing more despicable than cowardice. It wasn't violence that for Gandhi was the most repellent of human uh, instincts. It was cowardice. I want to read yeah. a quote uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you quote in What Gandhi Says. Gandhi says, quote, my nonviolence does not admit of running away from danger and leaving dear ones unprotected. Between violence and cowardly flight, I can only prefer violence to cowardice. I can no more preach nonviolence to a coward than I can tempt a blind man to enjoy healthy scenes. Nonviolence is the summit of bravery. And in my own experience, I've had no difficulty in demonstrating to men trained in the school of violence the superiority of nonviolence. As a coward, which I was for years, I harbored violence. I began to prize nonviolence only when I began to shed cowardice. Norm Finkelstein. Well, you know, it's a, first of all, it's a great quote, and there are many quotes like that in Gandhi. And it's hard sometimes for a person to understand the logic, because a lot of people on the left, they take nonviolence to be sort of wimpish. and. They want violence because it's more, you know, macho and so on and so forth. But Gandhi comes along and he says, but I think nonviolence takes more courage than violence. So at the beginning when I read that, I thought he was just saying it for rhetorical effect. But then when you read what he actually means, it's actually sensible. He says, if you believe in violence and say there's a war, your enemy, your opposite, has a weapon. And you have your weapon. So at any rate, yes, you're risking your life, but you have something to protect yourself, your weapon. And you may survive the encounter. But Gandhi says nonviolence means you're supposed to march into the line of fire, and now I'm quoting him, you're supposed to march in the line of fire smilingly and cheerfully and get yourself blown to bits. That's what nonviolence means for Gandhi. You're supposed to get yourself blown to bits. During the nonviolent uh, activities, you know, in the, the, the various campaigns, he would say to his followers, don't be a coward and go to jail because you're afraid to get killed. Don't use jail as a pretext to get away from getting killed. You better, and I'm quoting him, you better get your, small, your skulls cracked. Otherwise, I don't want to hear from you. So the, the irony is, even though Gandhi is attacked by people on the left for being wimpish, the fact is he sets such a high standard. 
I couldn't meet it. I mean, I have to be honest about those things. I wish maybe if I'm thrust into circumstances like that, I'll find the courage to do it. But sitting here, no, I couldn't honestly, I couldn't honestly say I could meet that standard. I'll give you an example. A couple of days ago, a friend of mine, my webmaster, Sana Kasim, she sent me a video of a fellow, an American Jew, uh, protesting in the occupied territories. And every time the Israelis fire the tear gas, he's, of course, running in the opposite direction, of course, and it's being filmed. And I'm thinking to myself, but Gandhi says you're supposed to march, go right into it, and you're supposed to get killed. But, I mean, he was very strategic. He wanted to achieve an end. He didn't want just to have people killed. He, mm -hmm. most importantly, was to accomplish what he was driving for, Indian you know, independence. Uh, uh, Indian independence. Well, we have to be careful, careful, clear about Gandhi. Sometimes he's reduced to Indian independence. But, no, he had a whole program of Hindu-Muslim unity about— uh, and he led many campaigns. I mean, it was news for me also. I'm not pretending as if it's common knowledge. Uh, but Gandhi was very careful. He would only take on public campaigns where he said the public already recognized the wrong. So let's take one example. In the 1930s, he led a major campaign against alcoholism, which was a big problem in India. And the people said, but Mr. Gandhi, why do you focus on alcoholism? There are many other problems. We have a problem with people who are addicted to racetrack betting. And they're addicted to the cinema, which, you know, Gandhi thought was a sin. So he said, why do you choose, um, <clears throat> excuse me, why do you choose to focus on alcoholism? And Gandhi's answer was very straightforward. He said, because Indians already recognize alcoholism is a problem, but they don't recognize that racetrack betting or the cinema is a problem. And then he said, it's wasting time. He, Gandhi always said, I'm a man of action. I want to get things done. And so he wants to start with where public opinion is at. You see, for Gandhi, politics was not about bringing enlightenment to the masses. No. That's sort of like the Marxist tradition. We're the vanguard. We know the science, the science of Marxism, or in my day, the science of Marxism-Leninism. We have the science, and we have to bring enlightenment to the benighted masses who suffer from false consciousness and all sorts of other, you know, maladies. Gandhi is not that. Gandhi is sort of like the Occupy movement. Yes, he's very much like the Occupy movement, because the Occupy movement started from where people were already at. The Occupy movement comes up with a slogan, we are the 99 percent. The basic point being, 1 percent are hoarding it all, and 99 percent are getting nothing. And it, ha it immediately struck a responsive chord with Americans, because that's how we already felt. They started what made the slogan so successful is they tapped into a sentiment that was already there. They started from where the consciousness of the American people already was. Nobody had to educate us that the system was unfair. It had been rolling before our eyes for the last several years or more. And so what made their movement so successful was, I think, the Gandhian tactic. They found the perfect slogan that embodied the consciousness of the American people at that moment. If they had gone a little further in their slogan, they may have lost the people. And that, I think, was a real—for me, it was a real insight in Gandhi, that politics is not about enlightening people. Con politics for Gandhi, to use an expression, is to quicken the conscience of the public, to get them to act on what they already know is wrong. And actually, it worked in my own case. You know, personally, I'm a person of the left, have always been, and always railing against the capitalist system, the unfairness of the distribution of wealth, and so forth. When I started to hear about these folks in Zuccotti Park, it resonated for me. But when I heard they're camping there, I said, all right, Norm, you're heading towards 60. You're not going to Woodstock. It's, you're past your prime. This is not for you. And so I just was an observer a sympathetic observer, but an observer. And then when I 
heard about, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I heard 800 people are arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge. I said, okay, no, it's time to do something. Now, nobody had to tell me the system was wrong. What people had to do was quicken my conscience to act. And that's what Gandhi and uh, nonviolence is all about, getting people to make the kinds of personal sacrifices which will force the bystanders to say, okay, I really have to do something now. If they do it, why aren't I doing it? And that's what Gandhianism was about. But also, as I said, you have to enter a thousand caveats, qualifications about his uh, commitment to nonviolence, because it was not nonviolence that for him was the ultimate sin. Actually, I've read through about half of his, uh, as I said, half of his collected works. He uses, I know it's a paradox, he uses the most violent language, not against those who commit violence. Actually, he says he was an admirer of Sparta, because he admired the courage of the warrior. And he always used military metaphors. It was the army of the nonviolent. He was the general. He always used martial metaphors. But he said, as I said, he reserved his most violent language for cowards. He literally says they don't deserve to live. A coward does not have a right to live. You know, there is where he gets, you know, stuff. Gandhi was very strict about nonviolence. You have to be nonviolent in thought, word, and deed. But you could say he sort of verges on violence, violent language, thought, and word when it comes to cowards. And I have to say also, probably in his classification, I would rate a coward. I, I mean, I'm not proud to say that, but he had such a high standard of um, what political commitment was about and the sacrifices you were obliged to make if you want to be moral, morally consistent with your values. It's a tough act. A thumbnail sketch of who Gandhi was, mm -hmm. since you have studied him. For people who, as you said, have a very um, sort of scant, a sort of caricature of who he mm -hmm. is, explain where he was born, why he well, came I'll tell to you, adopt I, I, mean, I, I like to always be honest. I didn't look too closely at the biographical data. I mean, I know as much as you, what you might say a Wikipedia entry might say. I was more interested in the theory. I was interested. Uh, I, I, I began the whole project uh, because I said to myself, well, you know, uh, is um, India under Gandhi, not under, under Gandhi's influence, it faced the same sort of challenges as Israel-Palestine. First of all, Gandhi wanted to end an occupation like the Palestinians. Second of all, Gandhi was confronting the great power of his day the superpower of his day, namely the British Empire. Similarly, the Palestinians have to face a formidable regional power, namely Israel, and right behind it, the superpower of our day, namely the United States. And thirdly, the Palestinians don't really have a military option. That the only way they're going to succeed is if they try these tactics that Gandhi pioneered in India. And so I felt, for those three reasons, trying to end an occupation, facing a superpower, and the only tactical option is really nonviolence, it would be interesting to see, okay, how did Gandhi reason the whole thing through? And that was my impetus. I don't know the history better than sort of a generalist or, for that matter, uh, Gandhi's personal biography. He was a, you know, there were many things about Gandhi were very eccentric and also very autocratic. You know, what Gandhi was, you do it my way or, the high, or go the highway. He was very, very autocratic. And he said that what he decides to do is not based on reason. Reason comes later. It's what his inner voice tells him to do. Well, obviously, you can't rationally argue with an inner voice. Either you agree or you don't agree and you leave. I, I did have a good opportunity when I was in South Africa a couple of years ago. I went to see his granddaughter, Ella Gandhi. And I remember her saying to me, and it just came out in conversation, she said he had great confidence in that inner voice, which is, you know, what you would nowadays we would say, we would call it he had good political instincts. 
But you can't argue with an instinct. An instinct tells you, do this at this moment. But you can't really argue with it. And so it was very hard. You know, reading him, there's this, that streak of uh, uh, autocratic, that autocratic streak, which is very unpleasant. On the other hand, and, you know, I sort of get emotional, you can but admire that man. I mean, the kind of moral force he had, it was just terrifying at the end in 47, you know, Egypt during, excuse me, Israel, uh, India erupts in this horrible bloodletting, the partition. They estimate like a million people were killed. You go into the streets of Calcutta, literally 10,000 bodies in the street. All the blood is literally flowing in the streets. And Gandhi comes in, and the first thing he does is he goes to the Hindu temples. Now remember, this is where the intercommunal hatred has reached a fever pitch. And he goes into the Hindu temples, and he insists, I'm going to begin each religious, uh, each uh, uh, service, prayer service, I'm going to be begin it with a passage from the Quran. The Hindu were going mad. What do you mean the Quran? And he is adamant. I am beginning with the Quran. And there would be the hecklers and the people who were worse than hecklers. He would stay with them in the temple the whole night. He said, I'm going to sit and reason it through with you why I'm beginning with the Quran. And when he went on the hunger strikes during the terrible bloodletting, you know, to his credit, you, can, you can't take it away. They stopped. Okay, it's true they stopped killing each other temporarily. You can even say they stopped briefly. But for the Mahatma, for Gandhi, Gandhiji, they stopped. You know, that's, it's very impressive. Of course, the downside is that kind of moral power came and went with Gandhi. There was nobody else commanding that kind of moral authority. But it was a very impressive show. It, it really was. And it gets me a little bit angry when people on the left, who I like, you know, and they're very harsh on Gandhi. No, there were a lot of problems, no question about it. But there, there went the men. Author, scholar, activist Norman Finkelstein. Uh, he has just written the book out this week, What Gandhi Says About Nonviolence, Resistance, and Courage.